You are listening to Salty Believer Unscripted, a conversation on Christian ministry and the Christian life. This is Salty Believer Unscripted. I'm Brian Catherman. And I'm Josiah Walker. And we are talking about Christian cancel culture today, Josiah. All right. Um, maybe we should first give a quick little little blurb on cancel culture. So popular sure. cancel culture, what am I talking about? You want to try to take a swing at that? You, I mean, I'm sort of putting you on the spot, but sure. generally speaking, when we say cancel culture, give me an example of, hey, of cancel culture. I feel like it's when you find out somebody did something wrong or maybe they weren't as um, upright and outstanding as, as you thought they were previously. So you just want to get rid of them, any memory of them, anything that really attributes to them, statues, books, resources you just you just want to wash them from your memory and from history right okay i think that's a pretty good that's a pretty good take and we had we had a season where this was really popular with statues in america oh it turns out this person had slaves it turns out this person fought for the confederate south during the civil war let's rename schools let's let's take all these stuff that honors this person we've now said hey we don't want to to honor and remove it right and and i i kind of got to see this up close and, and personal uh, when I was in Iraq, when they dis- when they deposed Saddam Hussein, and then, you know, the people were excited to start tearing down his statues. I would say the difference between something like that and something like, you know, a statue of somebody who owns slaves or General Lee from the Civil War or something, the difference was Saddam was just removed from power and he's the one who put the statues up. You know, <laughs> sure. and they're all like, okay, take his stuff down, get his face off the money, but... We have other cases where we have these long-standing, you know, pictures of history. And the argument has been, um, you know, like, what's an argument in your mind for don't just rip all the statues down? What, what can you think was argued for why we should keep some of that stuff? Well, if you, if you don't remember history, you're doomed to repeat it, right? So I think it kind of helps, one, uh, see where we've come from, but really helps us understand that these events actually happened. You know, when you get rid of all the Civil War stuff, Confederate or Union— it kind of wipes that away from remembering that, hey, our country was this divided at one point. We need to make sure we never do that again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, and what about, okay, so what about when a person has done lots and lots and lots of good, but also um, did something, you know, was a slave owner? Or sure. what happens when we when we say that now has to be canceled? What do we lose? Everything good they did, you know. Right, and, and, and at the end of the day, all of us have a black mark in our history somewhere. None of us is good all the time, always, right? Right, so we should all just be canceled completely. Now, there's a lot of people. I don't know. Maybe, you were, I, maybe you'd be willing to be transparent. I'll go first, even. During some of that time, kind of in like 2020, when it was just like, let's rename everything, let's rip down right. statues, I was having a really hard time with that. I'm yeah. like, can we slow down and, sure. and talk through this and find a way to capture some history? Can we change some signs next to these statues to say, hey, this right. person did this good thing and invented this and did this or whatever, but also had this? Can we be more honest about it? That was my feeling. I don't know if you were like one of the, I mean, there were some people who were just like, we got to stop this cancel culture. And there were other people like, we got to, you know, light the fires and go more. Where would you say you were at kind of in that season? I, I, was, I was frustrated too because it felt like for me that we swung the pendulum too far. And we didn't really think through the unintended consequences. A perfect example would be the Washington Redskins football team. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got rid of that name. We were like, oh, we're so sorry. And then the family who had that guy's picture on the helmet said, actually, we were honored by that. And we want that on there, you know, and now they're trying to get it back on there. And that was sort of the, I remember the same thing happened at my alma mater at the University of Utah. Some people raised the question, like, is this wrong? And all the Utes were saying, like, actual Ute Native American yeah. peoples were saying, no, 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 this is really good for us, and our kids get to go to school for free, and this honors us, and we get to do a yeah. tribal dance in the middle, and we're really respectful. The one thing they did say is we didn't like the the stuff that has nothing to do with our people, the tomahawk right. chop type stuff, yeah. and the big yeah. giant headdresses and sure. riding around on horses. Yeah. But once we had a conversation, the school had a conversation, it became a thing that was a really good relationship, right? But we just slowed yeah. down. That's the key right there is there weren't enough conversations. If we had conversations and got rid of the stuff that was a little extreme or off base or didn't make sense, that'd be one thing. But what we lost was the honoring of good things or good people or good memories. So Right, 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 right. Okay, so that's just cancel culture. But I want to talk about Christian cancel culture. And, and Joe, I know you know what I mean by this because at the time we're recording this, and there'll be a little bit of a delay, so I know that 
I know that there's going to be some people that maybe more information is going to come out, but just recently, um, uh, Steve Lawson yes. had this fall stumble, or at least it came out. I don't even know the detail. I don't know any of the details. Yeah. Um, I know that he had confessed some kind of inappropriate relationship with a woman. I don't know when, I don't know to what extent. And then I know the church pretty much terminated him immediately. It, so it seems the websites all shut down. You can't find his sermons on the websites. Uh, you have a subscription to his magazine, right? Yeah. I mean, our listeners might not know who he was, but he he's a, a big was a big pastor in Texas, had a big church out there, and had his own ministry, One Passion Ministries, that had like an expositor magazine. He did a lot with preaching. I think he taught at the Master's Seminary there at John MacArthur's yeah, church. Yeah, I think he's in the the Doctorate of Ministry and Preaching. I think he might have been so pretty a preacher you, for a long time and helping preachers and really I, providing tools and resources to equip pastors. He's in a ton of videos. Yeah, I mean, he's in a ton of movies that I've like. He's in movies commenting on things. Uh, you might recognize his voice or his face if you've been in the Christian circles. But so here's what happens: this happens, and then shoo, he's gone. Like he's off the right. radar completely. Yeah. And and maybe maybe the transgression happened years and years and years ago, and they've determined that all of his ministry since was disqualified, unqualified ministry. But it, it it makes me wonder, like, are we going to be able to, is books just going to be removed from the shelves? What's going to, we've, it's like Steve Lawson, the Christians have just absolutely canceled him. And I don't know if there's yeah. any restoration or, uh, there's no value in the stuff he provided. That's almost how the behavior is. Now, I'm not saying inappropriate relationships with women aren't disqualifiers for ministry. I'm not saying that's okay. We should not notice that. But, but he has had a lot of helpful, good, I think, God-honoring material published. So what do we say of that when now this comes out? The same thing happened with Alvin Reed, right? right. Alvin Reed had written yeah. some books. I can't remember the name of the titles, like Sharing Jesus Without Fear. He had done a ton of work. We've had him on this podcast before. In fact, I think we right. might have been one of the very last interviews oh, he ever did yeah. before he had some kind of something came out. I don't even know what. And now it's like the seminary where he was at was what, Southeastern, I think, is where he was at. I've heard from some students that were there, were like, you can't even quote him, and you can't use any of his materials, and all his books got pulled off the shelf. It was like, burn all the books, get rid of all the books, and some of that I heard was at his request. Sure. I don't know, but it seems like now, it's like we've just completely erased all the work that Alvin Reed has ever done. Right. Right. And, and Yeah, go ahead. And that was a few years back, right? That was what, right before COVID? Wasn't it was it? before the pandemic, yeah. Yeah. So, and we still don't really know the details of what happened or what the fallout of that was or what the issue was. And so, well, and that's what makes it hard because right. I'm not saying I have to know everything that happened, but right. at what point did the ministry disqualification happen? And here's the question for the podcast Was the stuff that a minister does before this big disqualification, should all of that stuff be removed? Should all of that stuff be erased? You know, should we cancel everything? Or is there still, is there, I mean, these are really big questions, right? right. This this bleeds into ideas of like, what should we do with Hillsong songs if you sing those in your church? What should right. you, like, okay, so Hillsong is still a ministry going on, but some things have happened. What do you do with, uh, let's go to Mark Driscoll. Like, you do you sure. have the, what was, Doctrine? What was this theology yeah. book called? Yeah, it was called Doctrine, and it was uh, Mark Driscoll and Bershears wrote that book. Uh, and it's a reformed, it's hardcore reform, pa- yep. like, and, and so... He obviously was, I mean, he didn't get canceled, sure. clearly, because he's still going. But he had like a radical change of his theology. The church sure. let him go. All this stuff yeah. happened. Do you still use a guy's book when his theology completely changed? Yeah, that's a hard one, right? Because it's a really solid, theologically rich book. Like if you're a Reformed guy or you want to know what Reformed theology is, it's a great resource for that. And uh but then his church did fire him. He had some issues at his church with his leadership style. Then his theology completely changed. Yeah, now he, he like speaks opposite. back against his old theology, right? right? Like now he's like, that was terrible. So it's hard because I, in that situation, so I would say, yes, read that book. It's a great book. I've read it. It's good. It's pretty accessible for systematic theology compared to some yeah. others. Like it's, right? yeah. it's, it's smaller than um, Grudem's systematic theology. But the problem is if you say, yeah, that's a good book, then – People are going to want to read other things by Driscoll because you recommended a Driscoll book. And some of his other resources might not be as good as that, right? Or might even be harmful. And that's how it is with with worship songs, too. When you look at songs from Elevation or Bethel or Hillsong, there might be a couple songs that are like, yeah, this is actually a really theologically rich song. This is good. But if a congregate in my church 
hears us playing that song on Sunday and goes, oh, I want to listen to that song. They pull it up on their Spotify app, which then opens the door to the rest of that genre and those bands. All of a sudden, they're listening to stuff that's maybe not glorifying to God or honoring to him. It's tricky. This is a this is a hard area. There's a book I used to recommend all the time to people, and and the author, I think, wrote a good book. But I've noticed it's a friend of mine, so I want to be cautious here because I'm not sure. It right. seems like there's been a swing in some of that theology, and I haven't followed it closely enough to know that if if I say, hey, this person's a good person on that topic, you know, so now I qualify it, and I often say, hey, I know that book was really helpful, right. but this person has since had a shift in theology, so I can't really yeah. recommend anything. But I have to say that every single time I recommend this book now, which okay. in fairness, like we should be, disclaimer. yeah, it is, a, I mean, but in fairness, we should kind of always be saying, use discernment, read with right. discernment. But the question that I keep coming back to you with this whole situation with, with Lawson is, is, should we be completely just sponging out everything? Right. I mean, I don't so know. That's, that, that, that's where I really struggle because so with Driscoll or somebody whose theology's changed, you can have a disclaimer of like, okay, their theology changed. Don't buy that book. But what happens if you don't know the details? Like we don't know the details with Alvin Reed. We don't know the details with Lawson. Was it? And there's been know? others. Recent? There's Ravi Zacharias. He was yeah. he's dead, and then it came right. out that he was having issues, and therefore, boom, let's just erase he everything he ever did. But. You know, what What if you're looking for those books? Like Lawson wrote a great book called Called to Preach. Called to Preach. I just read it. Uh, it was really helpful. It's helpful for new pastors and stuff. It was an easy read. It wasn't really heady. I can't even find that book, I don't think. I mean, Amazon has it, but places like Ligonier, who published his books, have gotten rid of him. His church website has deleted all of his sermons. So what do you do? We just said audio a resource like that, or, or how do you... I don't even know. It's so, well, so complicated. So let's think about Ravi for a minute. If if you took what Ravi said at many things, and I've actually seen him a couple times live. Uh, I, I used to listen to a yeah. lot of the stuff he did. And you went, wow. Okay, if somebody else said that, who didn't have one of these big disqualifying issues, would it be God-honoring and good? Would it be helpful? And would it be true? Right. Right. Or then this guy, you know, says it because he had a sin stumble. Is it untrue? I mean, all I keep coming back to is like Balaam and his and his mule and the, you know, and all the stuff in the Bible. Like he's he's going to be used of by God, and even the mule is like this is a this is a hard thing. So I don't I don't we probably should land somewhere on this, but our listeners hopefully understand the complexity. I would say this, and you taught me this when we were on staff together. Always use discernment when you read a book or you look at a resource. What did the author get wrong? What did he get right? You know, don't just say, well, this guy wrote it, so it's 100% good and perfect. The other thing I would say is, you know, we all have those blemishes. So if we took cancel culture to scripture, we wouldn't have any of the Psalms that David wrote or anything like that because he messed up with Bathsheba. And that would be a big disqualifier for the king of Israel, right? Like right? That, That's a doozy. You murdered, <laughs> covered up murder, impregnated the guy you murdered's wife. Like, there's a lot of problems there. I think we can't miss the point that these issues are heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to see somebody that's been a godly leader, that's been a, a great resource to the church, have a sin stumble like this. It's it's heartbreaking for the family, and, and you just want to pray for the church, for the family, for him. Because I, what do you do if you're that guy, and all of a sudden you've been canceled? You don't have a job. You don't have any books out there anymore, so you're not, you have no way to make money. You're, no, and your you're, family's you're probably terribly person. embarrassed. Yeah. And so not only are you wrestling with the sin issue that you had, but now you just, you're sitting at home, just uh, the depression has to be overwhelming as you just, your whole world is just collapsed out from under you. Right. So you have to pray for those people. But I also believe that God uses this like the blemish on David, like the blemish on Lawson to show us that only God himself is perfect and all of us are marred. And so he's the only one we can't make idols out of these guys. A lot of times these celebrity pastors become idols that we worship and we look up to more than God. And so it just really points us back to him. Well, and so here's the thing. I don't want any of our listeners to think that we are we are not concerned about the ministry disqualification, right? That That is a very serious thing. And the people who stand in the pulpit and preach God's word, yeah, th that's a big deal. I, I mean, 1 Timothy 3, you know, 1 through 7, and I, I'm, I'm constantly looking at that for myself. You know, the saying is trustworthy. If any, if anyone aspires to the office of elder, 
or overseer. He desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, which that's a tall order right there. Mm -hmm. uh, a husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well. And this comes back to like, what happens if your kids become unbelievers as adults or in this place or yeah. that? Like, this is tough stuff. What happens if this thing happens, that thing happens? Back to verse 4. He must manage his, his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of a devil. I don't know how, I mean, like, like all of those things have the potential to be a real big problem, right? Yeah. They, they really do. Obviously, um, issues with, you know, sin issues with the woman are a big, big deal. Yeah. So, and so have... obviously that's a thing. But what do you do with all the past ministry? Right. I mean that's tough. Okay, so so Josiah, what do you do? You're, we don't know. We don't know Steve Lawson's circumstances. Okay, sure. so right. so we're not going to use those. But let's just kind of come up with a scenario. You're sitting on a board. You're working yeah. with somebody who you're on a ministry, you know, or or you're on a church elder team, and somebody uh, it comes out that um, you know they had a they had an affair, a one time event, or some something in a moment of time. And then immediately yeah. comes and confesses. Okay, I remember. I think I think there was some aspect of this with um, uh, Matt Chandler, right? He came and said, "Hey, we had this kind of inappropriate." And he, came, I think he brought it to their attention, but I'm not sure. I don't remember. I didn't. I mean, I don't pay yeah. attention to these things. But in any case, what do you do if you're sitting on the elder team and this comes out and let's say you're not the lead pastor, right? Or maybe you right. are the lead pastor, but the choice is on you. And I'll take a swing at this too, but to say, okay. We've now had an incident. Do you, okay, I think both of us would agree we need to step that person out of the pulpit. Maybe there's a restoration path, hopefully. Maybe maybe it's terms for right. termination. There's Okay, but that's not what I'm getting at. That, you deal with the sin, you deal with the responsibilities, you deal with the ministry. What do you do with all the sermons that were on the website before? Oh, I see. So not how do you walk with the guy through the process, but what do you do with everything he's now, done before that? Now, I want to talk about, you should. we should be about, the Ministry of Reconciliation, Restoration, right. yeah. as a Christian, as a brother. Right. Steve right. Lawson will probably never step in a pulpit again. Right. Right, because maybe he's disqualified with whatever right. the circumstances. For, I mean, yeah. maybe that's done. But yeah. he needs to be restored as a brother in Christ, as a, in the church. Like, that would be terrible if we just said, well, you're horrible, and kicked him to the curb. But I'm talking about all the past work, right? And I'm not, so, like, it's one thing to say, okay, this this pastor hasn't been on the, hasn't been preaching here for 20 years. We're going to let that go. Right. But I'm talking right. about stuff where people are still still coming to it, still benefiting. What yeah. do you do with that? It's your choice. What do you do? Man, I don't know. That's a tough question. You know, I understand both sides of that argument. I think there's something to be said for deleting it, especially if, it, if you find out this guy was, you know, something really crazy. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing is what you do moving forward, right? Like, it's, it's how you handle it moving forward. Um what would you do? I, that's a tough question. I think this is where a plurality of elder, elders is very important. And you can depend on the Holy Spirit, hopefully, to help everybody and give them wisdom and walk through it. Each situation would have to be examined carefully. But I would try really hard to find a way to communicate. This was all of good benefit, like the books, right? This is still a good book. Maybe there needs to be a, a reprint of right. some kind. I probably, if I, I don't know. If he was a pastor who had preached and there were online videos on their website i'd probably stick them off in their own category with a disclaimer that says hey this you know we found out this about this individual these were good videos please you know use discretion in looking at anything he does from this point on but if these resources are helpful we want to leave them out here as an archive yeah so. this this being we're talking about the pastor had a sin stumble that same week came to the elders we're not talking about a long standing in the past sure. like yeah. i think i would i think you know, I want to think about how does this impact the church? Right. How does this impact our ministry? Yes, it's embarrassing, but are we going to stand with this brother through the right. challenge and take some of that embarrassment as the ministry goes forward? Hey, you know what? This brother had a sin stumble. We've immediately removed him from the pulpit. 
we appreciate his his work in the past, but we think it'd be we want to see him come to restoration. Um, you know, in a situation where it's this long-standing hidden sin the whole time, sure. that might be a whole other story, right? And so each one of these is going to be case by case. But I think the it's hard for me to see the answer is you never existed. You know, right. we're going to shun you from all things now because is that out of embarrassment or is that out of punishment or is that out of sure. protection for those who might listen to a sinner preaching? Because right. a sinner preaches yeah. when I preach every time I'm preaching, yeah. I'm a sinner. No, it, I never walk behind that desk feeling like I'm qualified and worthy. You know, I always feel like I'm unworthy, you know, and that's just, and that's where before we even look at what do we do if something happens, we need to back up and really be praying for our pastors and yes. really lifting them, them and their families in prayer. Because if, if this person weren't a pastor, these sin stumbles wouldn't be as public. You know, like you said, there's a tall order for the, the man of God who preaches the word of God. So we need to be praying for them uh, because we all struggle. You, there's there's nothing extra special about you or I. Uh, right. We, we sin just as much as everyone else. So we, we need prayer as much as everyone else. And, you know, the people need to recognize anybody listening who's sitting in the church, this hurts the whole church. Yeah. And so it's a it's a really big deal. These people need to be be men of character and be praying for them because it will affect all of the ministry, as we can see in these circumstances. Yeah. And, and and you know, yes, this one's really big in public. They're all I mean these these big ones are doozies. But it's not any less painful if it's your church in a small town. Now your church falls apart. I mean, I remember hearing a story, a guy's been on this podcast, it was Brett, he used to be on this podcast all the time, said, you know, um uh he was at a church. It was like his first ministry. The pastor, I don't even know who, um, had an affair with somebody that worked at the church, like two staffers. And yeah. he said the church like went like lost like eighty percent of its yeah. its attendance overnight. Yeah. Like everybody just went, well, what in the world? And then just this whole big disastrous thing. And that's the key, right? Because it's not just limited to these mega church pastors that you hear about. I saw on one of my social media groups this week somebody posted, "Hey, my church. It looks like the same situation just happened. We need a new church." Where can we go? Do you oh, know my it? goodness. And so they're just wanting to bail out, too, because it's just painful and it's hard. And, you know, you know these people. You've been doing life with these people. Well, I do want to commend Brett and, and his wife. They uh, said, well, we're going to we're called here. We're going to stick it out and we're going to minister to these hurting people. But you have to recognize all this stuff is big. And, and it's easy as Christians to go, well, that's it's the pastor's fault. You ruined everything. But is that what we're really called to do? We're called to get in the fray to. Yeah. recognize how the gospel informs and transforms like it's hard not to just look like the world and say well let's just point a finger let's erase this person from history and move on yeah. right yeah. we actually have to address there is sin there is brokenness yeah. we need the gospel even yeah. the preachers who stand in the pulpit need the gospel now again you don't have to put the person in the pulpit right you know and then you, yeah. it's just helpful to sort of walk through where is the line and how do we work this it's just hard i think the yeah. point of this whole thing is just to say it's hard yeah and we should think more deeply about it rather than just be gossipy and scandalous and get excited yeah. about it and try to collect his books or i don't know whatever you know yeah there's not a blanket answer for every situation and every person other than to point him to jesus love for pray for him love him you know care for him and we should them. be praying for the elders that are helping hopefully restore and walk through and care for and pray for the family. I mean, it's a tough deal. Yeah. That's a tough deal, man. So hang on to your, your book if you found it to be really helpful, if you can't sure. find it anymore, which yeah. is kind of hard, right? Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. Um, and, and so the other thing is like, I never, I never looked back. I never searched it out to figure out, you know, what happened to Alvin Reed other than to pray for him and his restoration. There's another brother that, that I was getting to know and I considered him a friend and, and uh, then there were some problems sure. and I don't know what the problems are, but I pray for that brother often. Occasionally I'll send him a text and let him know I'm praying for him because yeah. I think that should be the Christian heart. We shouldn't be all about the gossip and the what happened. We should be about how right. do we see the gospel redeem lives in the people of these ministers? Right. Cause man, it's sad and it's hard and we yeah. should be praying for our pastors and, and ministers. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Well, that's a doozy. That's a doozy. Hey, I'm starting. I've gotten some emails, by the way. I'm just changing oh, awesome. the subject. Uh, we don't have time in this podcast, obviously, to deal with some of these, but I'm starting to get some emails, which is great. If you have a question, if you have a comment, something you want to talk about on the podcast, um, you can email us at saltybeliever at gmail.com. Yeah. Or you can go to saltybeliever.com where we have lots of this kind of stuff. And you can, um, you can 
that go to a little message thing, send us a message. You can find more videos. You can find more podcasts. And I just want to encourage, if that's helpful, um, I hope it's out there. I want to let you know that there's some pretty crappy stuff out there uh, on our website because, you know, we don't always do everything perfectly. And I want to let you know that there's a, there are a couple of people uh, that we have done podcasts with that are no longer in ministry, a, a handful yeah. of them, who have yeah. been either canceled or whatever. Now, we still have, for example, Alvin Reed's podcast yeah. up yep, because I found it to be very helpful. Yeah. We have some podcasts up of some people whose theology has changed or yeah. that we don't agree with. But yeah. if it can be beneficial, we want to say, listen to everything, including our podcast, with uh, great discernment. And then and then hope that God will use it to transform you. Amen. All right. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thanks for listening. Salty Believer Unscripted is a production of SaltyBeliever.com. Visit the website to find more resources like the podcast you've just listened to.